all the respected delegates who are present offline and online welcome welcome back to the last day of SCP icon 2023 so one of the most interesting and most awaited session of any conference is the paper presentation and I think we will start the oral paper presentation we are really uh, fortunate to have with us Professor S.P. Dhaneriya sir. We welcome you sir. So along, along with Professor S.P. Dhaneriya sir, we also have uh, Professor C. Prabhakar Reddy sir from Nijam Institute. I welcome you sir also to become the judge and may I request Professor C. Prabhakar Reddy sir to say a couple of words because this prize uh, is dedicated uh, by sir and his team. So may I request sir to kindly introduce the prize and say a couple of words to the to our delegates. Please sir. Good morning everybody. So as clinical pharmacologists, we I think uh, most of us from South India, or we started our life with uh, one or two of great people and uh, I think they are known around the country. The person who started this for us, specifically for us and we are proud to say that we are students of those great people. So, in their uh, honor, last year we had uh, announced two couple of prizes. One, I think everyone would have heard of Dr. Naidu, a great person, a great teacher. Now, sir is happily staying at home, having a good retired life, but sir is more depressed because he has stopped teaching people. His passion was teaching and now there is no one to teach. So, in this condition, sir is little bit depressed. So, we, in his honor, we like to, we have announced uh, best oral presentation, which will carry a prize, I do not remember, I think 10,000. Last year, we have announced and it was given also. Then this and uh, the second one, which we have was another great, great person was Dr. Shobha, Shobha U. Dutta, a great person. She will not speak out, she will not come out, but when we go to her, she is not going to leave us until we are satisfied with what doubts we have. And personally also she was very good, like she used to help us so much for students. So in these two people's name, we have one oral presentation prize and one paper presentation prize which unfortunately. I think uh, we missed, is it being telecast? Uh, 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 fortunately, what happened is that uh, this year, last year I personally supported it. So, and then 15,000, then somebody asked why can't we have a lump sum amount as a fixed amount so that every year it can be taken care of. So, fortunately for me, because this year I am not going to put from my pocket, <laughs> is that uh, one society like uh, Society for Pharmaceutical Medicine and Research has come forward to support the prize. It is headed by Dr. Sinha, Subhidip Sinha and I am a member secretary of that association and there are various other people from some parts of the country who are part of the association and they have come forward to support this prize today. So, we thank them. And this is our intention of uh, having these prizes to encourage mostly students. So, next time we will have for students only prizes because we want them to come out and next time we will keep a condition minimum 15 oral and 15. If they do not come with this many, we will say there is no prize. So, we want all young minds. Now, almost we have around uh, 30 to 40 uh, seats in the country. Okay, All of them have to come forward to compete. 
a set should come where we have so many price, uh, applications for uh, presentation we should be able to reject them based on their uh, these things so we wish every student to come forward and participate next year it is in mumbai mostly so <coughs> if more people come we'll uh, we'll ask the sponsor to make increase the prize money also and we'll try to ask them if you are so many so many so much good studies if you have we'll try to ask them for funding so if you this is an encouragement for you it's very small amount 10000 5000 it's very small amount if we take it personally but this is a small encouragement you start doing your work more we'll try to increase the price we'll try to come out with more uh, uh, like a sponsorship of small small studies so you have to encourage us so that you will benefit and your students are going to benefit so i'd like to take this opportunity for thanking the organizers who have done a great uh, work i think for the last uh, one month i think our uh, person will not he'll not be hang any sleep or uh, full tension because we had the same feeling when we were last year conducting ispr so i take them i take this opportunity to congratulate them for organizing this this is a small one because we are now just growing up we are just kids this is a small one he is lucky to escape because he has started conducting second time so when let us imagine fifth conference or sixth conference at the end of four five years you give organizers big headache okay thank you and i wish all the best to the future students and the presenters who are going to present thank you so may i invite the first presenter dr kumar vel dr kumar vel j so very good morning to everyone the research work uh, as a part of my thesis uh, a small part i'm just want to present in this uh, perfect platform so the topic is a development and validation of an hplc method like lcms ms method for quantification of sensor dd in human plasma and application in pharmacokinetic study of acute myeloid leukemia patients so coming to the background sensor dd is basically a dna hypomethylating agent uh, which is uh, already approved for the maintenance of remission in aml patients but being tried for induction of remission in aml patients those who are not the candidate for standard 7 plus 3 regimen and also the not the candidate for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation so because of the instability of this particular sssid dd so uh, it is very difficult to isolate this from the plasma and also from the uh, quantity quantity in the plasma so aim of the study is to develop and validate an lcms ms method uh, for the determination of sssid dd in human plasma and to apply in a pharmacokinetic study in aml patients that is acute myeloid leukemia patients coming to the metal methods so we need chemical reagents instrumentations lc conditions ms conditions and preparation and uh, mobile phase and choosing of column and the preparation of shock solutions and working standards coming to the chemical reagents as i said in that is reference standard uh, purchased from toronto research chemicals and is we have used is 5 methyl 2 deoxyhydridine then tetrahydrouridine which is a stabilizer like for to uh, actually azazidin will be getting degraded easily so to avoid the degradation we should use the inhibitor of the cysteine dmnase uh, so it will prevent the degradation of the azazidin and also other chemicals like water methanol acetonitrile these all lcms grade we have used coming to the lc conditions so we have used c18 column that is column is the heart of lcms like uh, lc then mobile phase is so this a mobile phase and b uh, this is uh, we have optimized by using trial and error method like uh, by different permutation and combinations so this is the mobile phase a and b coming to the lc conditions that is uh, we have used gradient method not the isocratic one so uh, this is the flow rate uh, like 0.6 ml uh, per minute and this is the time uh, run time that is 7 minutes so this is the this is the concentration of uh, this mobile phase a and mobile phase b coming to the chemotherapy conditions as uh, so over temperature is 50 degrees celsius flow rate is 0.6 ml per minute run time is 7 minutes auto sample temperature is 5 degrees celsius then elution technique is gradient method coming to the ms conditions we have used cyx uh, uh, mass spectrometry 
that is uh, uh, triple quadruple 3500. So the mass spectrometry was operated by using positive electron spray ionization mode. Uh, so which was controlled by a software called analyst software. So this is the MS conditions. So this is the curtain gas which is used and this is the spray uh, like ionization spray which is 5500 volt. Then this is the temperature and this is the gas spray ion 1 and 2. This is the MRM that is multiple reaction monitoring uh, like I did in, this is uh, uh, in Q1 it is 245 for IS that is 5 methyl deoxyside it is 242. So this is the dual time. This is the potentials, the different potentials which has basically it is uh, in the uh, MS conditions. So this is the analyst software I was telling which was used for this uh, uh, LCMS uh, reporting. So this is the chromatogram I got uh, while doing this um, LCMS. So basically in X axis it is the run time. And in Y axis it is intensity. Um, so you can see the peak over here. So at uh, 2.60 minutes I got the drug that is unlit of my interest that is fire associated I got in 2.60. So THU that is tetrahydrouridine which is I used to stabilize this associated degree prevent the degradation uh, that is uh, I got in 2.87 and IS internal standard is very important I got in 2.95. So it is highlighted here. 2.9695 uh, is the IS. So this is the results I got uh, from the LCMS. Uh, you can see uh, um, this is the blank, blank, black IS on calibration standards. So this is the analyte concentration, known concentration which is used and this is the area I got. So from here you can uh, see that uh, I got uh, accuracy of 82 on 10 uh, percentage, 120 percentage. This is the IS area. So coming to this uh, particular graph, this is a, a, a linear equation curve. I got uh, R of uh, 0 0.99. Calibration curve based on this analyte concentration known and area ratio. That is analyte area and IS area. So this is the calibration curve I got. Uh, the R squared is 0 0.999. So this is basically done for QC, uh, for accuracy and precision, QC controls. So low QC, middle QC and high QC are done. So we have got a good accuracy and precision. So matrix effect also I did uh, as a part of LCMS uh, for aqueous and also for the plasma extraction in different uh, samples like 6-6 uh, six, six helicots we have done. So this is the mean value, this is the mean value I got and this is the coefficient of variation I got uh, like 7.7. .7. This is for LLOQ, this is for ULOQ that is upper limit of quantification. So based on this study like research work, so uh, I hope the, uh, the method is validated and it's, uh, be, uh, it is uh, uh, simple, accurate, precise and also uh, we have followed uh, ICH FDA guidelines for validate this method and uh, we are also able to get the assassinatedine and IS and tetraiodine were eluded in different retention times and 2.6 minutes is the retention time we got. So coming to the discussion, there are two studies only available, uh, they have already done this work. Uh, so they have used solid waste extraction method, I have not used, so I made a simple little easier. Coming to the conclusion, uh, so it is possible to conclude that uh, this method can be used for my study. Uh, for the pharmacokinetic study in AML patients for quantification of hazardity. This is one of the patient sample I have uh, got the peak. So these are my references. So uh, gratitude to ma'am, uh, she is my mentor and he is the LCMS analyst so he helped me a lot uh, during the method development and validation. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity sir. Okay, there was a nice presentation. I think uh, <coughs> during development, I think you did development also. Yes, sir. Development and validation. Yes, sir. And what are the various parameters you looked on which are going to influence the level of uh, outcome? Like what are the parameters? Matrix, matrix effect, sir. Uh, then uh, stability. So we have uh, checked for stability also. Like different stability, uh, what are the different parameters you checked? Uh, stability may sir, uh, we have checked for 45 days stability and 60 mm -hmm. days stability in the plasma in minus 80 degrees Celsius. Sir. 
minus 80 yes sir just yes. minus 80 or some the, range the, the the sample was frozen at minus 80 and also uh, minus 80 was done and also minus 20 also done so when you say that you have followed ICH FDA guidelines yes sir there when we go and see the method development and validation yes sir you have so many variables that yes, are sir. going to yes so many parameters are there sir. Okay. Yes, sir. okay so the work which you, which you have done is good yes sir so now I think I want to ask a general question. Okay, sir. You have done a great work. What are you are going to do with it, sir? Uh, so basically, uh, we can be able to quantify the assessment level, sir. So <laughs> ongoing thesis is there, my research work. Okay. So I can apply this LCMS method over there. Oh, so so it's a part of your research. Yes, sir. So it's part of your thesis. Yes, sir. It's a PKPD model I am doing. So I want to apply this method for quantification of the levels That's there. That's good. Yes, is it going to have some value to the patient who comes to your institute? Definitely, sir. Actually, it will help in uh, not as a routine clinical service. Uh, so, for developing some nomograms, it will be helpful. So, once I quantify these levels, I can put these data into population uh, pharmacokinetic modeling. So, I can develop some nomograms. So, it will help for ultimately for patient care. It will help, but not as a routine clinical service. We cannot use this because, as per per se, this assessment is not required as a routine clinical service tedium. So, okay. so this is another thing which I want to say in the first day. So whatever we want to do, let us, this is not for you, okay. let us do it so that at the end of what we did, you just have a question when you start doing, is it going to help the patient? So once you do something and your colleagues or somebody starts using in your institute, you get credibility. Yes, sir. And they start asking Kumar, well, where he is, where he is. Even if you are out of PGI, they will call you and uh, ask what should we do. Yes, sir. So once you do something to patient care, we, we need not look back and we are going to boom ourselves. Until that, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. so next time for this awards, we will be asking each and everyone what is the relation of your work to patient care. Yes, sir. Okay. Best of luck. Thank you, sir. Any questions? So next, if no one asks questions, we will give him minus marks. Hmm? <laughs> Please ask questions. Yes. <laughs> and he should. Uh, I ready to answer. Yes. Uh, like I try to answer. Please. Let us make it a, like Some let us make it a class. Okay. I think we have Manjunath waiting to ask something. Yeah, Manjunath, you can ask. Manjunath. Please, sir, go ahead, sir. I think Sinha, sir, has come online. I think he typed that, can I ask question and left. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. So, when he asks question, we will ask the same question. I try question. to answer, yes. You have to answer. Yes, sir. Hmm? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Dr. Brototi Shannal. Good morning. So, uh, my study title is A Single Center Retrospective Comparative Clinical Study Between Dapagliflozin and Empagliflozin in Patients of Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus Already on Metformin Monotherapy. So, both Dapagliflozin and Empagliflozin come under a relatively recent class of oral antidiabetic medications. They block the sodium glucose cotransporter 2 protein uh, located in the proximal renal tubule thus inhibiting a major part of glucose reuptake in the body. <coughs> Besides reducing the plasma glucose level, <coughs> they also decrease the blood pressure and body weight, which attributes to long-term favorable cardiovascular effects. However, the chances of lower urinary tract infections, both by mycotic and bacterial, are increased due to glycosuria caused by these agents. 
So objectives of my study were to compare the clinical effectiveness of dapagliflozin and empagliflozin in terms of reduction in glycated hemoglobin, fasting blood sugar, postprandial blood sugar and body weight from baseline <coughs> and to compare the safety of dapagliflozin and empagliflozin in terms of incidence of UTI. So materials and methods, study type and design, it was a retrospective observational study. Study area was general medicine OPD and pharmacology department of College of Medicine and Shagodatta Hospital. Duration of study was 4 months from 1st March to 30th June 2023. So inclusion criteria, patients of either sex aged between 18 to 71 years who are either on dapagliflozin 5 or 10 mg once daily or empagliflozin 10 or 25 mg once daily for at least 6 months in addition to metformin. So sample size was total 47, 26 in DAPA group and 21 in EMPA group. Convenient sampling method was followed. So it was a prescription based retrospective study. Prescription of 47 type 2 diabetes patients who were either on dapagliflozin or empagliflozin for at least 6 months in addition to metformin were evaluated. So the current biochemical details of FBS, PPBS, HbA1c data of all the participants were statistically compared to the respective values 6 months earlier as stated in the prescription. So changes in body weight and history of urinary symptoms during the same period were also analyzed. So now comes the results. So the baseline FPS, PPBS and HB1C values between the groups did not exhibit statistical difference. However, the data after 6 months showed that pressure among the EMPA group had numerically better but statistically insignificant glycemic profile in terms of number 1 HbA1c. So I have shown here a bar diagram to compare the final uh, HbA1c values after 6 months in both the groups and p value is 0.4. So next is the FBS values after 6 months. So in both the groups, DAPA group and EMPA group, uh, another bar chart has been shown. P here is equal to 0.66. So again, non-significant difference. Next is PPBS. So here again, P is equal to 0.9 and another bar diagram to show the final PPBS values after 6 months in both the groups. And uh, body weight wise, uh, the, uh, this is reverse, that is in here DAPA group has appeared better, that is DAPA group has shown better weight reduction in study. So P is equal to 0 0.524 and a bar diagram to show that. And here is a table showing the four parameters and the respective values in both the groups after six months and also the respective P values have been shown, all are non-significant. And finally, UTI. So three cases were UTI of UTI were reported in each group. So in DAPA group, it was 3.84%, and in EMPA group, it was 4.34%. Uh, that is, in EMPA group, incidence was slightly higher. P is equal to 0.462. That is again non-significant. So next comes discussion. So EMPA group showed better reaction in glycemic profile in our study, which was similar to a clinical trial conducted by Hussein M. et al. But our study showed comparatively lesser incidences of UTI and better body weight reduction with dapagliflozin, which was contradictory to the referred study. Our study showed that EMPA had numerically better but statistically insignificant glycemic profile after six months, but in a similar study conducted by Ku Ija et al., the difference between the two groups were found to be statistically significant. So strength of my study was that it was a real world study and um, limitations were it was a single center study, sample size was small, convenient method of sampling was followed and it was a retrospective record based study. And conclusion is that both the agents are comparable in efficacy and safety in type 2 diabetes patients for at least 6 months along with metformin and symptomatic UTI appear to be the commonest side effect. However, they are self-limiting and they usually respond to the common antibiotic therapy. So these are my references. Thank you. Very, uh, thank you very much for good presentation. You mentioned that dapagliflozin, in some aspect, it's better. Yes. So, so, as far as weight reduction is concerned, yes. what can be the reason for that? 
रीजन आई थिंक दैट मे बी ड्यू टू चांस ऑल्सो बिकॉज आई हैव टेकन अ स्मॉल सैम्पल साइज सो वैन वी टेक अ स्मॉल सैम्पल साइज ऑलवेज इट कैन बी जनरलाइज टू द पॉपुलेशन द रिजल्ट तो आई थिंक फॉर दैट ऑल्सो इट कैन कम दैट बेटर वेट रिडक्शन सो इन योर स्टडी वॉट इज योर कमेंट ऑन क्लिनिकल सिग्निफिकेंस वर्सेज स्टैटिस्टिकल सिग्निफिकेंस um clinical significance uh i think uh, uh both the agents are uh, in a clinical uh, setting i think both the agents are very much uh, efficacious and uh, in various other studies i have seen uh, past studies i have seen that empa is better effic- efficacious but here i think gapa um, has come better so i think uh, both the agents in clinical setting both the agents can be given with almost equal efficacy and uh, you have looked for adverse effect only yes, urinary sir. tract infection yes have you looked for any other problem with uh, this sglt2 uh, inhibitor no i ha- i uh, there are other side effects also like there is uh, diabetic ketoacidosis and all q uh, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis euglycemic yes but uh, as uh, the time was short for the study actually yeah. i uh, because it was a retrospective retrospective only record so nothing based. was uh, there in record record so i only uh-huh. asked about the urinary uh, symptoms uh-huh. i also didn't check for that microscopic results of uti which i should have no. i only asked for the symptoms uh, and that only uh, any difference in bone density um uh, bone density uh, i didn't ask for it it happened sometimes uh, there was not in any record Uh, record you, you you went to the retro uh, record record it's a record uh, based study yes uh, no hmm. there was nothing as like okay, that okay okay ha uh, the topic is open for discussion please distinguished delegates are ha uh, sure sure please please go ahead with permission from the uh, judges i am asking you you had shown the glycemic efficacy though statistically not significant in favor of empagliflozin yes it was only numerically um, so what are the other drugs you had not shown anything in the baseline what are the drugs patient was consuming and yes. during the period what are the drugs patient was consuming yes uh, i just said that along with metformin uh, they were given metformin plus only metformin uh, no other anti diabetic agents were used only metformin plus this sglt2 inhibitor only that yes and what of what about the duration of diabetes duration of diabetes actually in the uh, group i have group? not i have not seen actually a duration exactly i have not seen i have seen uh, i have taken such patients uh, whom uh, it was not controlled by metformin monotherapy so another agent was added sglt2 inhibitor and uh, at least 6 months that sglt2 inhibitor was given so, so a- a- apart from that Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors patient were not consuming any other group of drugs no. so uh, in the baseline is there any possibility if the duration of diabetes is not matching so there is a possibility of uh, confounding yes. variable yes that is possible i didn't so you had not that. taken that no and what is is there any difference between re- retrospective study and record based study uh retrospective study record based study um yes uh, retrospective stud- uh, st- study can be uh, can be taken from the means if the history is taken from the patients uh, about their means history uh, disease so what actually you had done i had done from the prescription so it's a retrospective record based study from the prescription yeah, um, no about the urinary symptoms i asked the patient so it is a retrospective study in one slide you had shown it is a retrospective again record based study yes yes that will be retrospective actually not record based and what about the real sample size actually if you want to see the clinically effective uh, differences so what should be the actual sample size for this particular mm-hmm. study that i have not calculated that i should have calculated actually sample size would have been much greater actually i don't know the exact question uh, anything else please please yes yeah, i am not doctor sir yes sir you can ask sir yes ask so first uh, first of all group uh, the group of pointers one is that 
you mentioned that you have done it from March from May to the end of the period. March to June. March to June, twenty three to June, twenty twenty three. And when was the you know, you took an observ observation you were you were going uh, so you did the observation now or you did the observation during that period? I did that during that period only from the prescription. It cannot be called cannot be called a retrospective study. It is a prospective observational study. Okay, so during that period, if you are doing as the prescriptions are coming, it cannot be called retrospective study. Actually, I said re But, retrospective because I saw from uh, six months uh, ago what were the initial uh, values <laughs> before starting. Maybe it's more of an idea because you are also observing some of the current prescriptions. Mm -hmm. is, is that assumption right? Uh, yes. So don't don't call it either retrospective or prospective. It's an observational study. Okay. And secondly, when you say in observational studies, so these are not controlled, not interventional. Effect efficacy is a very strong term. The word that should be used is effectiveness rather than efficacy. Efficacy is used only in the and uh, used in probably in the uh, control trials where there is a. Uh, So, third thing is uh, you know uh, you cannot draw much conclusions under the data under compliance or the drugs during this period. Uh, so, drawing that because uh, if if the patients have missed certain drugs, uh, some some dosages during the period uh, of observation. They are very, very likely to change the outcome of your, uh, you know, the, especially in the and that's why efficacy is not the right word. We should have done only the safety study without without being much better because primarily observational studies are or possible uh, are meant to detect safety as a primary point. And last but not the least, uh, uh, when we did the study, we did only regulatory conditions, ethics committee conditions, ETR registrations. CTRI, uh, no, I have not taken. Uh, for ethical clearance, I have applied, but I have not yet got. Actually, my. Thirty days. Uh, yes, sir. Thirty days is over. Uh, yes, study. Actually, my thesis topic is on dapagliflozin and vildaglipten, so MD thesis. So during that, I already collected data on dapagliflozin. I am collecting. So during that time, I also collected some data on EMPA, and I did the study. Actually. My point is that we have a thesis. प्रोटेक्शन small question yeah, what kind of bias can come in these kind of studies the one you have performed uh, bias uh, confounding bias that confounding factors for how much time there is diabetes i have not taken that history okay. and uh, compliance uh, patient compliance so that i have also not taken that they have whether they have regularly consumed the um, drug or not and anything more specific which is particularly applicable for these kind of studies where you see 
Urinary recall bias can happen recall about the urinary symptoms from yes. the patients. And is there any structured format of prescription in your institute which has all the data of this HbA1c, fasting, glucose, or it is randomly written by randomly the physician? Randomly written, not anything. So no. that itself will, you know, most of the times, most of the data is missed. Only the important ones are highlighted. Yes. Right. And how have you analyzed the data? You are saying statistical significance between the two groups. Yes. What uh, statistics have you? Uh, I have done by unpaired t-test from by Excel. Okay, you have done unpaired t-test. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think thank you. Thank you. Is there any more question from the chat box? You can just check. Ma'am, uh, Usha, madam, you have any question, madam? You have raised hand, madam. Okay. So first of all, uh, we are really thankful to uh, Dr. Shuhudeep Sinha sir uh, because of uh, his initiative, Society of Pharmaceutical Medicine and Research had participated in this uh, conference to provide this prize money. We are really thankful to sir and also uh, I, I want to co congratulate this participant to be truthful that you had not taken the uh, permission from the ethics committee but I am at the same time uh, I am very sorry to say from the organizer side any study without ethics committee permission we cannot allow to uh, be contested. So that is a very serious issue. For future things you, you sh we sh all should remember that without ethics committee permission we cannot uh, do any study. So even if it is a retrospective study, even record based ob observational study, you should have a ethics committee permission. The ethics committee may think you, you, you no need to have a full board review, they can expedite the review, but you, you should have a proper ethics committee permission. So again I am thankful to you become, to become truthful, but we are, I think the judges will be agree, you have to. Uh, remember that. So now may I request the next participant, Dr. Paulomi Ghosh, please. Every single invention in medical science was done for the benefits of the mankind. But is it really always limited to its beneficiary effects? Good morning everyone. I, Dr. Paulomi Ghosh, second year PGT, Department of Pharmacology in Arjikor Medical College and Hospital, am going to present my original research article that is knowledge, attitude and practice study on prescribing fixed dose combinations among practicing physicians in a tertiary care hospital in Eastern India. Fixed dose combinations or FDC have been created to have a positive impact in the mankind, but its improper and injudicious uses also have, also have great risk factors to the people. Aims and objectives of our study were to evaluate knowledge regarding FDC and national list of essential medicine and also to assess attitude and practice of prescribing FDCs among practicing physicians. Ours was a cross-sectional questionnaire based observational study and was done among practicing physicians of various departmentals OPDs and IPDs and it was done from November 2022 to May 2023. Results were analyzed in SPSS version 28 and then documented. A sample size was calculated by this displayed formula and we have taken a convenient sample size as 152. A pre-validated questionnaire was taken as a study tool. Coming to the result, according to these two pie charts, 41.4% of study participants were of younger age group, that is in between 30 to 40 years of age group, and 54.6% of them were junior residents. Next pie chart shows the distribution of departments among study participants. M most common source of knowledge in our study were textbooks. This 3D column chart shows that 46.7% of physicians realizes the challenge to identify a FDC component which can cause adverse drug reactions. 56% of them were aware of the role of the FDC in controlling antimicrobial resistance. But only 9.2, just 9.2% were aware of the enlisted medications and FDCs in current national list of essential medicines. 
This component bar diagram shows a largely positive attitudes regarding FDCs among study participants. Majority of them prefer to prescribe FDC instead of individual drug to increase patient's compliance. And also, most of them admitted the necessity to know national list of essential medicine. Coming to the practice, we can see that 40.1% and 34.9% of the physicians always write generic names of FDC with mentioning proper dosages in the prescription. 45.4% of them always do counseling before prescribing FDCs and 42.1% and 33.6% of the physicians always prescribe FDCs from current national list of essential medicine after checking rationality of them. Most commonly prescribed FDC in our study were Montelukast with levocetirizine followed by coamoxiclab which happened to be mostly prescribed from medicine and chest medicine departments. Coming to the discussion, the result of this study showed that most of the study participants are of younger age group like previous studies. Like in other surveys, a higher percentage of doctors concurred that a prescription is required to purchase a FDC from the pharmacy. 53% of doctors educated their patients on the benefits and drawbacks of FDC in a previous study contrasted to our study, 45.4% of doctors always do the same. Like other study, ours indicated that inappropriate FDC prescriptions can raise the chances of adverse drug reactions. Textbooks were the most prevalent source of knowledge for FDC in contrast to prior study where only 42% of information came from textbooks. 58% of respondents lacked awareness about banned FDC. In our study, 43% were unable to name a single current banned FDC in India. Coming to the conclusion, our knowledge gap is persisting regarding disadvantages of FDC and rationality of commonly prescribed FDC. There is lack of awareness about the current banned and enlisted FDCs of current NLEM. This study demonstrates that despite a generally positive view regarding prescriptions, FDC practices have certain gaps. So we recommend that we pharmacologists can organize awareness program regarding enlisted generic names of medicines in current NLEM and FDCs. More number of articles should be published in different journals. Daily updates on the status of banned FDCs should be there and educational improvisation in different levels of postgraduate and undergraduate training are of utmost necessity. Thank you. Can I, can I come? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pallumi, for the presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, you mentioned about uh, National List of Essential Medicine. Yes, sir. 2022. So, how many FDCs are enlisted in this list? Sir, uh, in current NLEM, uh, 22 fixed dose combination drugs has, mm -hmm. has been enlisted. So, from your list most commonly prescribed, how many are there in that list? Because you have mentioned about 4-5 FDCs, yes, sir. which are commonly. commonly. I think first is there. Yes, covalent. What about uh, levocetirizine and montelukast? No, sir. Montelukast and levocetirizine is not enlisted uh, any, in the current. Any other which is not enlisted? Uh, sir, pantoprazole with domperidone is also not enlisted. Okay. And uh, aspirin with atorvastatin is also not enlisted. Mm -hmm. Now we have the the problem with this. Not only the ADR, they are bit. Costly medicines, FDCs are, yeah, their cost costly, is more yes. and uh, also this ofloxacin only does one, pantoprazole, domperidone, yes, I think uh, out of uh, these, uh, amoxiclave was there, amoxicillin, yes, sir. Clavulinic, amoxicillin acid. clavulinic acid and uh, antibiotic uh, cotrimoxazole is also included. Uh, Cotramexazole, but uh, it's not mentioned here. No, no, sir. The problem with us is that these is, uh, we have the list of FDCs which are banned. Yes, sir. But still they are available in market yes, and they are prescribed. They are that is the main problem. Yes, sir. Means uh, if we have banned the FDC, then the regulatory authorities should see to it that these are not not uh, not uh, been practiced not uh, been prescribed uh, means they should not be available in the market yes sir their manufacturing should be stopped yes 
Yes. Because that is the problem. We have also the WHO essential list. Yes. Uh, it has uh, 501 medicines are there and the FDCs are 51 there. Yes, sir. Uh, FDCs are 51. But we have out of 384, 25 FDCs are there. So very few FDCs have scientific justification for combining for in for ingredients. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So what do you recommend then? Yes, sir. What is the recommendation from your study? Uh, How sir, to make the people aware about sir, not using the irrational yes, FDCs? Uh, we have to organize awareness program by arranging CMEs. We can uh, we can mm -hmm. make the pay, uh, everyone aware of that. Daily updates of FDCs should be there and uh, publications of more journals on uh, FDCs and national list of essential medicines should be there mm -hmm. and educational improvisation yes, in yes, uh, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate training should yes, be there. Yes, so what is the irrationality behind the, this FDC that is to be stressed? Sir, okay. irrational, yes, sir. Ah. Irrationality of the uh, FDCs. Uh, rationality of the FDCs sh uh, should be, uh, FDCs are rational when they have different mechanisms of actions. Ah, we, we, we have a list of yes. rational FDCs where there is a greater efficacy or sometimes yes. we are reducing the adverse effect for better compliance. For anti-TB drug, we have the better compliance. Better we compliance. have many. Uh, Anti-retroviral okay. drugs, we also have. Oh, yes, definitely. definitely. Now, Topic is open for discussion. Questions from delegates, please. Uh, uh, hello? Uh, please, sir, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And I think it's a good effort to, uh, to, to try and rationalize, uh, at least to think about that question. In the Indian scenario, yes, there are, in fact, uh, one of the editors you mentioned, Monte, Monte Lucas, US citizen, yes. at one point of time, it was deemed uh, irrational. Yes, and it took several years to get tips approval. The point is, there are, there is no white and gray and white and black in, uh, uh, FDCs. Even if the multinational, uh, which are approved FDCs globally, many of them are pharmacologically, uh, supposedly irrational. Yes. Now the question is for this is there are a few things you need to look at. First is uh, uh, two things. Is that whether uh, in terms of in the market whether there are two levels of approvals. One is the CDFC approval, one is the state approvals. So many of these uh, this is, uh, which are uh, not uh, which are, uh, are approved by the CDSO but there are many more of these which are approved only by the state of the, the drug controllers for uh, manufacturing purposes yes, only. The state drug controllers only give manufacturing approval, but then they get marketed as well and branded. So uh, the, the, the education has to be on to the prescribers and uh, to make them understand this, the, this, this point as well, besides the See, so it's, it's not, I mean, whatever you learn in pharmacology, that okay, this is a rational, rational, does not always apply. There are also medical need, there are certain recommend, there are certain uh, conditions in the CDS, uh, in this uh, CDS guideline, schedule why, how the FDC is, so what are the points that, is, that allow you to make an FDC. So there are many other things. Uh, most of these FDCs, I mean, I would dare say all the FDCs that are, and uh, not approved in US, Europe, and, and, and Japan, the ICH countries have never undergone any drug interaction testing. Okay. The first thing that we have to also look at the safety aspects of your disease, safety. which is also a, a rational aspect. Yes. So uh, these are all based on theoretical combinations, and secondly, on marketing co-prescriptions, co, co that is called the co-prescriptions, and based on that, uh, either uh, there is another term called co-packaging, or uh, instead of that, uh, uh, besides co packaging, packaging will make up FDCs. And FDCs also have certain technologies. For example, there is there's something called uh, where two, two drugs are just packed together with, 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 with an inert uh, layer between them so that they don't interact pharmaceutically. So, we also have to look at pharmaceutical interactions. Uh, so, there are many aspects to FDCs which is not straight black and white, which we need which we to. Nothing to do with your uh, uh, presentations. The presentation is a good effort, uh, study, but uh, 
look, when you study this, look more closely on how FDCs get approved, how FDCs get prescribed, how FDCs get prescribed, how, what are, uh, what is co-packaging, co co-prescription, and then, like, uh, the FDCs which are approved, then actually may not always be so so-called actual. All these aspects need to be understood. Okay. Thank you. These are practicing physicians, mostly from junior residents, senior residents, and faculties of our hospital, that is Arjikon Medical College and Hospital. So, there is the universal bias here. Uh, so, better is the study to design in such a way that uh, the prescriptions when after delivery of prescriptions, you are uh, communicating with the patients with your prescriptions in hand. And, uh, and in the way, the order they have been communicated regarding this. Uh, and uh, because of the decision in this case. Otherwise, I think the law is a bit of uh, bias here, and we are uh, interrogating the speaking physicians. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the right Sir, FDC is mainly prescribed for uh, increasing uh, patient compliance. That is when many more drugs are giving, uh, are, are have, having been given to the patient. Then uh, if, a, if we prescribe an FDC which is rational, then it can be a cost, uh, costly, uh, it can improve the cost, cost-benefit ratio will be there and it will increase patient compliance. Dosages can be, uh, if dosages are appropriate and the time schedule and this proper mechanism of actions, there are different mechanism of actions and equally pharmaceutical, uh, equally pharmacokinetic criteria are there in the FDC, then we can uh, rationally prescribe an FDC and help the patients to, uh, in, uh, to improve compliance because most of the cases in, in this country um, uh, many if many FDCs are in if many uh, medications are single medications are being used and patient almost forget to take every medicine so if I, we prescribe a FDC then it will be easier for them so, can I ask a question please yeah you can ask yes. So, like uh, you are saying that the for the compliance, like uh, they might have given the prescriptions, right? So, whether these prescriptions uh, they are given and the patients have purchased them from the pharmacy, your pharmacy? Yes, sir. As uh, I have done this in hospital, uh, Ajikar Hospital, most of these patients. Uh, uh, the medications which are enlisted in the national list of essential medicines which are available in our pharmacy they have, they got it from there but if these uh, montelukas with levocetrizine and pantoprazole with dromperidone combinations are not available in our pharmacy so they have to purchase it from uh, different pharmacy okay so uh, coming to initial stage like how I mean, am I can miss it so how did you collect the data I just uh, have a pre-validated questionnaire and ask the practicing physicians uh, about this questionnaire and then I collected the data and uh, do uh, did the analysis. So did you give a questionnaire to the consultants or did you ask the consultants? No, I have given the questionnaires and uh, uh, to some, some practicing physicians I have to give them, uh, I give them the questionnaire and in some cases I have asked them. Good. So, can you present the question once, please? Yes. And the next thing that you see, you give a sample size uh, derivation formula. And again, next, uh, you said like uh, you have taken a, a communal sample. So, what is the difference between these two? Sir, uh, as no other study has been, uh, has uh, no other study has been done 
in this uh, in uh, in this topic in our eastern india so i have taken the i have used this sample uh, sample size calculation uh, and uh, after uh, and then we have taken this convenient sample size as 152 to uh, collect the data convenient sample size as how many uh, how many uh, practicing physicians i can approach and then i have taken the data so all of these things you should tell now whether you have a particular convenient sample or the derived sample no so ma'am so if you have taken a particular derived sample there should be some like uh, uh, reason for taking that sample uh, the parameter so if you say m you should tell like what is m if you tell delta what is the delta so those things you should tell if you tell uh, that you have derived the sample size yes sir no. i uh, actually i want to do this uh, study uh, uh, in a different uh, different region also so that is why the sample size i have taken and uh, then i will compare this these both to the both two datas i will compare okay so uh, i mean is this study uh, i mean everybody was asking me that you also whether this was uh, this kind of clear pardon sir yeah. yes, is this yes. study also is it complete load i have got ethics committee clearance institutional ethics committee clearance i have got okay okay this is the questionnaire so, of my study okay okay so so same thing i would ask you to register in the sitwala immediately if you are not completing the study so that uh, when you publish it will become a uh it will be coming better in terms of uh, its quality yes sir so uh, this is the the attitude so how do you mean that it is uh, validated or the question that is uh, validated question or no yes sir so what is the meaning of it uh, for validation you are asking sir No, 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 no. Oh, sir, I have first uh, done a thorough review of literature um, uh, for this FDC, and then uh, collected the questionnaire. And after that, I we have uh, make a uh, we I have given those questionnaire uh, with my mentor and guide to other faculties of different departments in our hospital, and they have just gone. Uh, they have. told about they have given the scoring like the uh, uh, 1 2 3 4 like this scoring that is likert scale sco scoring after that after getting the likert scale sco scoring where 3 to 4 that is 80% of the questionnaire is valid then i have i have put those questionnaire in uh, in my uh, questionnaire like this i have validated okay so uh, you said that you want to increase the awareness of uh, the fdc right yes, Yes, sir. So, how do you plan to increase the awareness? Sir, I want to organize. Uh, we pharmacologists can organize awareness program by doing CMEs or seminars in various uh, various uh, places, like in our country. And we can do uh, publications of more journals or articles should be there. And there should be daily status updates on the banned FDC. And educational improvisation is also utmost necessity for. postgraduate and undergraduate training okay thank you sir so uh, next step what will be your next step sir my next step uh, is to uh, is to award the uh, practicing physicians for this and to uh, and to, i want to publish this uh, this in a, as a journal or article so that uh, many more can be aware of this fact okay so we will take the question uh, question from the consultants so we will take them as a group or like an individual in a single room like how do we do so i just i have i just go, i went to the departments and uh, given the questionnaire to and uh, gave the questionnaire to them like in medicine department i went and there are junior residents and i i gave them the questionnaire and so with the when some some were some were busy i asked them the question the answer and like this i have collected the data okay. so you are not doing the group of people right 
a uh, group of people like uh, yes i have uh, depicted the uh, pie chart that uh, there are junior residents senior residents faculty no, no, not like that so maybe you know like two or three participants here at a certain point of time or in how much time will they complete the questionnaire like uh, 15 to 20 minutes i guess i have not Okay. 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 so what happens is that once you present the institute uh, results in institute they know what are the band they this is what are to be used what are this so that you get your uh, attention in your institute okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you. we we'll call for the next uh, so now may i request dr 